Hi, everyone. Who's voted? Who's not voted? That's just my commercial for election day. Um, but Susie, it's, isn't it ridiculous that in this day and age in the state of New York, we're voting on whether women should have equal pay? It's ridiculous that not only in the state of New York you're voting on it, but in many other states you're not even voting on it because it hasn't even gotten to the level that they're allowing people even to have a say in it. What's really ridiculous is that it's even an uh, issue today. I mean, when you have things like the CEO of Microsoft, just two weeks ago, did you see this, right, where he essentially came out talking to all tech women and said, if you're just quiet, if you don't say anything, if you don't really go for it, you'll have good karma, and your good karma then will prepare you for a raise. It's so crazy that, you know, that women aren't making what they should be making. Women work as hard, if not harder, than men. And it's just very sad that we still devalue a woman to this day. Okay. It is. Yeah. However, with that said, ladies in this room, if you aren't making the money that you think you deserve to make, it's also partly because you have stayed silent. It is because you aren't speaking up for yourselves. It's because you, you are so afraid that you're going to cause trouble. Men have absolutely no problem, and they have it right on this one. They have no problem asking for what they want. They have no problem saying, no, I am not going to take a cut in pay just because you're doing bad. No, I want to be paid for vacation. Women, on the other hand, oh, it's all right if you need to decrease my salary so that you make more, no problem. So no matter what society is dictating for you does not mean that you have to put yourselves on sale. It doesn't have to be that way, and you can make a difference. Okay. It's true. Let's just backtrack a little bit. I want to hear a little bit about how you got to where you are now. Now, you started as a social worker major, and then you moved to California. Yeah, and landed a, my dream job. As a waitress. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. Yeah. How did I do that? I was a really good egg flipper. Uh. I was. It's true. The story goes that um, after four years at the University of Illinois and never really getting, I think, above a C the entire time, I did what most people do at the you know age of 21 um, or 22, and I borrowed $1,500 from my brother Bobby and bought a Ford Econoline van, a used one where I drove out to California, had $300 to my name, and lived on the streets for three months until in the van until I landed a job as a waitress. And I stayed a waitress all the way until I was 30 years of age, making $400 a month. And I had a brilliant idea one day, which was I was going to open up my own restaurant. Because for seven years, I was a waitress. And my Parents had no money. My mom, you know, was a secretary, sold Avon on the side. My dad was always sick. And I was never expected to be anybody or anything. And, but all the customers that I had been waiting on all those years lent me $50,000. Your own to, personal Kickstarter. Say that again? Your own personal Kickstarter. Yeah, it was. And, and to open up my own restaurant, because I had told them about my idea. And they had me put it in a money market account at Merrill Lynch. I didn't know what a Merrill Lynch was. I didn't know what a money market account was. And I had a crooked broker. And to make a very long story short, in three months, all $50,000 was lost. So I didn't know what to do, because I owed these people $50,000. And I thought, I know. I can be a broker. They just make you broker. And I was hired when I went to interview for a job because it was affirmative action in 1980. They had no women working for them as stockbrokers at that time. I was told that women belong barefoot and pregnant by the manager of the Oakland office of Merrill Lynch, and I would be fired in six months. Of 
course, I asked him how much he would pay me to make me pregnant. And when he, uh -huh. I did, uh -huh. and when he told me $1,500 a month, I thought, oh, that's $9,000. That's what I would make in two years as a waitress. I was hired, and during the time I was there, to make another very long story short, I sued Merrill Lynch while I was working for them because I realized what the broker did was illegal and that I couldn't stay silent about it. And I wanted the money back so that I could pay back all the people. In two years when it came to, they couldn't fire me after I sued them. I didn't know that. And, um, and I didn't. You know, because I thought I might as well sue him. I had a friend who was a lawyer who said, Susie, sue him. And I said, okay. They'll say, I'll do it. I did it. I'll do it on contingency. I said, okay. And they couldn't fire me. So by the time it came to court, I was their number six producing broker. And, and they just gave me back all $50,000 plus 18% interest. I was able to pay everybody back. But that's how I started in my financial crusade to protect people, because I knew the system didn't protect them. I learned firsthand financial advisors had their own best interest at heart, not their clients. And I decided right then and there I was going to be a financial advisor that cared more about people than the money that they could make me. Um, what do you think of yourself now? Do you think of yourself first as a TV celebrity, or as an author, or as a financial advisor, or something else? I think of myself as something else. Like, I know all the accolades I have. I have the highest accolades you could possibly get, seriously, from Time Magazine, who was so, when I first started, did all these articles on me that ridiculed Susie Orman. She's connected spirituality and money like Big Whoop to naming me one of the top 100 most influential people in the world twice to their Time 100 list. Forbes magazine, who did an obliteration on me years ago, naming me to their most influential list. So I know all my accolades, but I don't care about those things because they're just labels. I think of myself more as, truthfully, first, KT's spouse. Where are you, KT? There she is. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I love KT more than life itself. And if I didn't have money, I would figure out what to do. I would be OK. I'd still be happy. Money alone will never make you happy. But lack of money sure will make you miserable. That's besides the point. But to have found true love in my life and to be proud of it and now be able to express it to everybody is the luckiest thing. So I think of myself as a really lucky person and a kind person and a person that does what's right versus what's easy. And that's how I think of myself. And I love that I think of myself that way. The rest will come and go one day. You know, one day when I'm 80 or 90, you're not going to think of me as the Susie Orman unless I'm another Barbara Walters, but whatever. And, but, <laughs> but, but do you know what I mean? I'll meet people and they won't know that I'm me. The, with those labels, but they'll know that I'm Susie, and that's all that matters. When did you become Susie? I, be, I did not become Susie, I have to tell you, until it was probably 19, you know, 98, 97 mm -hmm. in there. You were asked Susie on iVillage. Oh, you, were one of the, you were one of the first financial experts that iVillage introduced. Oh, so you, uh, is that your question you're asking me? Or when did mm. I become Susie, the person no, who I like? No, when did liked? you become Susie, Susie the personality? But I remember uh, oh, I in that period yeah. that that was one of your first breakthroughs as a financial yeah, personality. Yeah, here's what started to happen in 19. I was a financial advisor. I had my own firm, the Susie Orman Financial Group. And I had no desire to be an author you know, you guys have to understand a little bit about me, which is when I was growing up, I'm from the south side of Chicago. For those of you who don't know what that is, it is the hood. It is the hood. They did not teach English. Nobody really spoke English. And so I had a speech impediment growing up, and I couldn't pronounce my R's, S's, or T's. And so I couldn't really read either. Do you know that I've written more number one New York Times bestsellers today than books I have ever read? 
I don't. There was a time when you were the Harry Potter of the business category. That's right. Yeah. Right. There was a there was a store for Susie Orman. Susie Orman. Yeah. And what was fascinating is that I just wanted to do a book to impress my clients. That was it. So I could give them a book. And some some publisher was willing to pay me ten thousand dollars to write a book and give me free books. Elizabeth Margolis of New Market Press. And I went, are you crazy? And the book was called You've Earned It, Don't Lose It. And that book somehow sold 800,000 copies in hardback. Most New York Times bestseller, or most authors in hardback sell six to 25,000 copies in hardback. And that was the beginning of Susie starting to become Susie. Mm -hmm. And it was never planned. And then Oprah helped you a lot, right? You yeah. sort of got that. And what did you learn from her? Man, I learned so many things from Oprah. I wouldn't even know where to begin. But what I learned from Oprah is how to be h how you are on TV and off TV. There was no difference from the Oprah that got on that stage and talked to all of the audience and the Oprah that once we were backstage alone, there was no difference in those two personalities. Mm -hmm. So I learned authenticity on the camera from Oprah. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to have a really incredible heart caring about people. I learned so many things from her, mm -hmm. yeah. Have you done things for other women to try to pay it forward the way, you know, she did for you? You know, I'm not sure Oprah tried to pay it forward for me. Because you have to remember, not only did Oprah do something for me, but I did something for Oprah as well. People liked watching me on the Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> you know, I was on the Oprah Winfrey show 29 times. And mm -hmm. Oprah would not have had me on the Oprah Winfrey show more than twice if the ratings weren't there every time I was on. Mm -hmm. So I am not just going to be this meek little person that goes, Oprah, help me. The QVC, help me. All these places, help me. I help them mm -hmm. a lot as well. Mm -hmm. What and drives you? Passion and love for people. Mm -hmm. I love people. I love people so much I can't even tell you. You know, you could stop me on the street. You could come up to me when I'm in a restaurant, and I will always make time for you. You have all made me a wealthier woman beyond my wildest dreams, mm -hmm. and I owe that to you. So I'm not one of these personalities. Like, I was just in this, um, Connecticut the other day, and we had 1,400 women there, and they all bought four books. And they all wanted each book signed. And they all wanted their picture with me. That took hours and hours. And I stayed until every single one of them left. I gave them everything I had because they deserved it. So I honor you. I respect you. And I will always be here for each and every one of you. OK, and then with that, we've got a pretty large crowd here. Does anyone have questions that you want to ask, Susie? If anybody wants to ask a question. Are you sitting here telling me that the world's personal finance expert is sitting here in front of you, and you don't want to ask me one question? Fine, I'll ask you. How many of you in this room have student loan debt? Raise your hands. And you don't have a question for me? How many of you in this room have credit card debt? Uh-huh, and you don't have a question for me? How many of you are scared to death that you're never going to be able to make enough money to pay off your credit card debt, pay off your student loans, buy a home? Should you do a Roth 401k or a 401k here? How should you be investing your money? What about a Roth IRA? What are, you know, little questions like that. Should you buy a home or should you just still rent an apartment? You don't have any questions for me? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> really, people? Really? All right, now let's try. Uh, Who has a question? Over here. Um, I had a quick question. What would be your number one piece of advice for a new entrepreneur in the financial space? When you say in the financial space, meaning are you thinking of becoming a financial advisor? Are you wanting to know just how to invest in the financial space? Be more specific with your question. Um, deal flow, venture capital, angel investing, more specifically on the entrepreneurial side. And my name is Arjun, like Argentina, but no Tina. 
by the way. Arjun. So, if you are that wealthy to be thinking about being an angel investor in venture capital, what in the hell are you doing here? <laughs> right? You need to walk before you run. Do, does AOL, do, do, are you offered a Roth 401k and a 401k? Or just a traditional 401k? A traditional. Oh, now Arjun, do you work here? and an entrepreneur at the same time, but you kind of were looking around and like, what do they have here? What are you currently investing in for your retirement account? Um, I am not actually. Um, ah, what, what you're else? not investing in a retirement account yet, but you're an entrepreneur. Yep. Why? Uh. <laughs> Arjun, walk before you run. Seriously. You, the only way you will ever be powerful with money and be able to make the right decisions as to who to invest in, who not to invest in, what to invest in, what not to invest in, when to buy, when to sell, is when you know your own thoughts and you are powerful about money and you don't need money. When you need money, then you make mistakes. You buy at the wrong time, you sell at the wrong time, you invest in the wrong thing. When you are powerful with who you are and what you have, you now have the clarity of what to do. So if you have to invest to make money because you need that money, you're going to make mistakes. Become powerful in who you are, what you do, and the way you do that is start investing now. These are your compounding years. If you put, how old are you? 23. 23. If you put $100 a month away every single month right now in a Roth IRA until you are my age, making normal market returns over 40 years, do you know you would have $1 million? But you wait until you are 33 to start. $100 a month, $1,200 a year, $12,000, just 10 years, you would have only $300,000 when you were my age. Those 10 years cost you $700,000. Invest now, now, now. These are your compounding years. The sooner you begin investing, the more money you will have. Thank you. We got one in the front. Oh, okay. Yes. Hey there. How's it going? I'm always torn with whether I should save more money a month or apply that towards my student loans. Or buy, or for a house? No, yeah, so just savings in general. I have a right. house now. So here's, you know, you can have your cake and eat it too. Right? I would imagine many of you in this room qualify for a Roth IRA. Are you an employee of AOL? All right. Do, and they offer you a 401k. Do they match your contribution here? They do They do, do right. a match. Yeah. So you have got to, bar none, you have got to contribute up to the point of the match. Yeah, I right. contribute 10% now. All right. Now, they do, do they match 10%? No. No, so why are you doing 10% when they only match 6? Because you thought I that was afford... a good thing to do. Yeah. It's not. I'll tell you why in a second. Are you doing a Roth 401k or a traditional 401k? Traditional. And they offer a Roth. I they don't do not. AOL, well. what is wrong with you? Tim Armstrong. <laughs> If you are watching this, and you should be, sir, you're never too rich to watch me. Um, <laughs> although Tim may be, right? Is that hopefully they will also give you a choice of a Roth 401k. But until they do, you would be far better off up to the point of the match and then do a Roth IRA. There are income qualifications, but I have a feeling you qualify for them. And that is where you would save. Now, here's what you need to understand why. Any money under the age of 50, you could put $5,500 a year in, 50 or older, $6,500. Any money that you originally put into a Roth IRA, you can take out at any time, regardless of your age or how long it's been in there without any taxes or penalties. So if you got that money and you were saving it in there and then you wanted to buy a home, you wanted to do something else and you needed that money, it's there. If you decide you don't want it, then you haven't missed all of these years to get money into a Roth. Do you see? So you could have your cake and eat it too. So that's what I would be doing at this point in time if I were you. So, so the takeaway is that I should put 
my savings into a, a Roth 401k. But in regards to like a my Roth IRA, a Roth IRA, I'm, I'm sorry. What in regards to my student loans, though, should I apply more money towards my minimum payments, or are you on the standard repayment method? Yes. Yes. So you have these loans that will be paid off in 10 years, correct? Right. At what interest rate? Um, they vary because I have private and I have All right. government. Private student loans are the most dangerous loans you can have bar none. Student loans are protected by the government against bankruptcy. Right? So you cannot bankrupt a student loan, even if it's a bank. How dare our government protect banks who are giving you student loans at high interest rates and you can't bankrupt them and the government is protecting the banks today? Ask me how I feel about that one, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you, your number one priority is to get rid of your private student loans because they have the ability to take you as high to interest rates anywhere that they want to. Once the student loans are gone, I would keep your federal loans over the 10-year period and to the retirement accounts. Yeah, next. One thing I want to point out that's happening here, do you notice how you ask a question and then I have 10 questions back for you? If you ever go to a financial advisor and you just say, I have $5,000 to invest, $10,000 to invest, and they just say, do this, that's a salesperson. A good financial advisor has got to ask you questions before they can answer what you need to do in your particular situation. So just take note of that. Susie, why do you think there is still so few females in financial advisory? Well, there's more and more. There's a lot of, you know, females out there, believe it or not. I just don't think they're the ones that you see. You know, if you watch CNBC, it's mainly males that are coming on there still to this day. But <laughs> financial so, planners, I mean, the statistics oh, a, are that it's still under 20%. Well, don't you think in almost every, every economic sphere, it's more men than women still to this day? Women still tend to go towards your traditional jobs of teacher, nurses, and things like that. So that I, I just don't think women have become as powerful as they were born to be. I think it's part of a socialization process still. And I also think when it comes to money, women, they don't take their power when they, it comes to money. Because you don't take your power because you don't think that your money is for you. You think your money, and you'll see this as you get older, is for who? First, you, as women, you will take care of your parents, your spouse, your children, your pets, your plants, your employer, your employees, before you take care of yourself. You would much rather see a friend get a promotion than you get that job. You will say yes to your sister who needs to borrow money from you even though you don't want to lend it to her or your brother or whoever because you rather say yes out of fear that that person won't love you anymore versus no out of love for yourself. Women have the ability to give birth in most cases. They have the ability to feed that which they've given birth to. Women's nature is to nurture. So it's not until they're in their 50s or 60s that all of a sudden they wake up and go, what? was I thinking? Do you know how many women walk up to me and say to me, Susie, what's the best way for me to save for my kids' college education? And I say to them, do you have credit card debt? Yep. Have you been saving for your own retirement? Nope. And you're asking me, how do you save for your kids' college education? It's a woman's nature not to think about herself. A few years ago, you were promoting the paperback release of Women and Money in Union Square at Barnes & Noble. Mm -hmm. There was a big fan club that turned out to see you there. And um, at that time, you were very anti-real um, estate. You were also anti-self-employment. Um, mm -hmm. Have your views changed on that, given what, that the economy is What, do you remember the year shifting? that was? It was 2010. All right, 2010. Do you remember what had happened in 2007? Oh, yeah. All right. The Women in Money book came out in 2007. Mm -hmm. and, and all those years, I was still anti-real estate, anti-self-employment, because we knew 
very close in there that we were going to have a depression. Mm -hmm. I know they called it a recession. I'm sorry, when houses go from 700,000 down to 150, that is a depression. Mm -hmm. When most of America isn't able to work and they're losing their home, depression. And I still felt that we were, in 2010, still in that environment. Mm -hmm. And it really wasn't until this year, believe it or not, that things just started to turn around for people who really weren't able to get jobs, were finding jobs again. In 2009, I wrote a book called The 2009 Action Plan. And on page six, I said in that book, it would be till 2014 or 15, till everything was relatively okay again. So, and I stuck by that, and I'm glad I did. So, how are you feeling now about those things? Like, have your, have your opinions changed yep. on, so, where are you on real estate? Real estate, I would only be buying real estate today if I had at least 20% to put down. Besides the 20% to put down, you need an eight-month emergency fund. Besides the eight-month emergency fund, you need a secure job, and you need to know that you can afford a fixed mortgage payment for a 15- or 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. You can afford that payment, you know, um, and property taxes, insurance, and $200 a month in maintenance, then you can buy a home. So if you're a college student right now who's you're not looking buying at 100000 you're no, not you're buying not. a house. Yeah. Ain't happening. Because what about if you're over 50 and you're highly educated and suddenly you find yourself shut down by the job market? You know, you're, then you're out not buying on your a house own. either. Yeah. Here's the thing that you really have to understand and in... Um, you know, 2011, I think it was, I wrote a book, I think that was the year, called Money Class, that essentially the American dream is dead. Mm -hmm. And that book was a very interesting book, I have to say so myself, um, in that you don't have to own a home anymore to really achieve the American dream. You have to understand the goal of money. And the goal of money is for you to feel secure and for you to be able to sleep at night. There are many multimillionaires who have never bought a home their entire life. So it's not real estate that's going to make you rich. What's going to make you rich is that you are, feel at home in who you are and what you have. You never want to put yourself in a situation where you are struggling to make a mortgage payment, struggling to make the property tax payment. Real estate is very, very tricky, far trickier than anybody has any idea. Well, I just unloaded two properties, so I'm sitting on some cash. What should I do with it? Why would you sell the house or two? It became more of a money pit. It was an old house with a lot of things going on, and it hot market felt like it was the All right, right time. and do you own another piece of real estate that you're Not at in? this time. All right, and so here you are, you're renting and you live in New York? I live in Hoboken, which is Hoboken. Uh -huh. yeah. And does any part of you want to own real estate anymore? No. Well, there you go. <laughs> All right, so what should you do with money, especially when interest rates are as low as they, they are? are I do not have a problem with municipal bonds. I do not have a problem with individual stocks that pay high dividend yields. Mm -hmm. Why not get 5 or 6% on your money in dividends with good quality stocks? Who cares if they go up or down? Mm -hmm. They're still paying you a dividend if you need dividends to live on. So it just depends on your situation. But I would so stay away from variable annuities, bond funds. Mm -hmm. I would run. I would not walk. Um, Universal whole life or variable life insurance, any of those people approach you with any of those, run. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions? So if I maxed out my 401k for the year, what do you think about investing in art? In art? Yeah. That's an interesting question. Besides maxing out your 401k, do you own a home? No. Do you want, no, no, of course not. <laughs> do you want to? I mean, maybe down the road. Maybe down the road. Do you have any credit card debt? No. No. Do you have at least an eight-month emergency fund? Yes. And are you skilled in the art market? Oh, maybe. 
I haven't learned yet. Maybe. So, you know, <laughs> art's a very interesting thing to invest in. You really have to know what you are doing. Would I rather see you before you invest in art? Would I rather see you have built up for yourself another stock portfolio outside of your retirement account? Oh, you betcha I would. Because when it comes to stocks or bonds, they're liquid. You can sell them like this. There's, you know, you can see what's happening to them all the time. There's no maintenance cost in keeping them. With art, you have to be careful. It's in your house, you have a fire, it's gone. Oh, you have an insurance policy now. Now you have to pay to insure it. Oh, you want to sell it. Well, nobody wants to buy it. What are you going to do with it? You have to, you know, I'd be very careful about making art as an investment unless you were really good at it. Okay. Yeah. I, one quick thing, I do remember, though, when I wasn't a whole lot older than you, I loved this one artist, and it was $700, and I saw him. I wasn't thinking about investing. I decided to buy it, even though I couldn't afford it. And then later on, I got in trouble financially speaking, and it was worth $10,000, and the gallery bought it back from me for that amount of money which means it was really worth 20000 That was luck. <laughs> Total luck. <laughs> uh, Susie, did you ever give someone a piece of financial advice that you later regretted? That I ever gave a piece of financial advice that I regretted? Mm -hmm. No, never. Oh, okay. Not once. Have you ever had a shred of lack of confidence? No. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Not one of... No. <laughs> right? Not when it comes to personal finance. Oh, yourself, inside, Susie. Oh, yeah. yeah. So when, how did you get over, like, how do you push through that? You push through that by, you know, let's go back for a second to 1980. Here I am, the only woman stockbroker at Merrill Lynch. All these other men, there were 100 of them. I'm driving a 1967 Volvo station wagon. They're driving Mercedes, um, BMWs, all these cars that I couldn't even pronounce the names of, Jaguars and so on, Aston, all these cars. And I knew I didn't belong. I was a waitress. I wasn't supposed to be there. So I got so afraid that, you know, I could barely, I was paralyzed with fear. So I decided I needed to create a new truth to get me past my doubt of myself. And I created this truth that went like this. I am young, powerful, and successful, producing at least $10,000 a month. Now, I was 30 years old, not that young. I was not powerful. I was anything but successful. <clears throat> and at least $10,000 a month, $10,000 a year, my father sometimes didn't even make that. So, but I wrote that truth 25 times a day. I said that truth silently to myself before I went to bed looking in the mirror and I would scream that truth in my car on the way to work 25 times a day. Every time I got afraid, I said that truth. Within six months, that truth became a reality. <clears throat> so my advice to all of you would be, if you're afraid of something, create a truth that's directly opposite your fear, as if it has already happened. Make it short enough so you can repeat it, so you can write it, and don't make it limiting. Notice I said at least $10,000 a month. There are times now that I can make $10,000 a minute. So <clears throat> it is very, I never limited myself. Do not limit yourself. None of you have a clue what the future holds for you. Susie Orman never could have imagined in a million years that I'm the Susie Orman that you read about. So there's a master plan out there. Don't get in your own way. Do you still believe in prepaid debit cards? I do still believe in prepaid debit cards. What's so sad is that because I was Susie Orman and because I tried to do something that was so good for everybody, I lost $3 million on that of my own money, by the way, but nobody would believe it. They all thought I had skin in the game and I was going to make money off of these people and they wanted to think something bad. <clears throat> I closed the card and what was so sad is that thousands of people got financially hurt because I had to close the card. 
All the other prepaid cards out there now are making millions of dollars off of people. It's really sad about that. But I closed the card because now I can meet with you know, Senator Wyden of the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee like I did just a few days ago and ask him to make it mandatory that credit bureaus report, that debit cards report to credit bureaus so that people can get a FICO score without people thinking I was only doing it because I had my own card. Do you wish in <laughs> retrospect that you hadn't gotten into the product line? Do you think that Sort yeah, of. I wish. Yeah, if I could turn back the hands of time, do I wish that I hadn't lost three million dollars on trying to help people? Oh, you mm. betcha, I did. Well, other products too. No, this, all the other yeah. products are still fabulous. You know, mm. we have sold over a million of the will and trust kits. People deserve to have a place to go and get something that they don't have to pay twenty five hundred dollars for, and you can get it for a few bucks somewhere. You know, the FICO kits, the insurance kits, all the products that I have, man, do I stand by them. You betcha I do. Do any of you have a will? A few of you. But not only a will, you need a living revocable trust, you need an advanced directive, you need a durable power of attorney for health care, you need the must-have documents. You go to a lawyer, good luck, you're going to spend $2,500 to $5,000 to do it. So what did Susie Orman do? Susie Orman, with her own trust lawyer, created a package that has a will and a trust and all these programs in it. They're my will, my trust. It's exactly what I use. And most of the time, we give it away for free. The real deal here is, don't you want to know that you have documents and things that are protecting you and that you don't have to pay a fortune for them because people don't have them? You'll love this. By the way, it has over 75 documents on it, 93 web links, 10 books. It has all these things. You should take advantage of it. A-O-L-K-T, write the webmaster to do it. <laughs> That's what she's doing right now. Uh, and share it with as many I people as you want. I think we have another question. <laughs> Hi, Susie. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Okay. So, question for you. I am completely debt-free. I am maxing out my 401k, maxing out my Roth. Um, I also have brokerage, and just trying to gain some insights as to what you think, if you were in my position, you would do next as far as investing. So ask me your last part, what I do what? What would you do next as far as investing if you were me? All right, so you have a brokerage account. Can you tell me who it's with? Schwab. Schwab. And do you have an advisor there, or are you telling them what to do with the money? I am doing it mostly on my own. All right, and are you investing in individual stocks or exchange-traded funds? I have both mutual funds and individuals. And the mutual funds that you have, are they loaded or are they mainly no loaded and are they managed or are they indexed? Great question. I don't know. Ah. <laughs> All right. So okay. I would be building up my brokerage account to be as much as it possibly could be. You cannot have too much money in a brokerage account. So if I were you, I would be taking a good sum of money and dollar cost averaging, which means taking money every month and putting it into those same mutual funds if they're good mutual funds and hopefully they're no load or exchange traded funds where they don't charge you a fee to buy them. And I would just keep doing that and doing that and doing that. I'm assuming that you have at least an eight month emergency fund. I do. And that I'm also assuming that you have no interest in buying a home or you've already bought a home. Uh, interest, sure, but... It's New York City, so having that 20% down is kind of... Yeah, is a lot. So yeah. why not just keep building up your money in your brokerage account okay. and let it keep going that way? Please stay away from anybody approaching you saying a variable annuity or we'll have a life insurance policy for you. The only type of life insurance you should ever buy is term insurance. Again, stay away from whole life, universal, or variable life. Listen, if all you ever remember me saying today is never buy a variable annuity, never buy whole life, universal, or variable life insurance, I've done you well. Thank you. Anyone else? But you're there? doing great. Good for you. Also, are you married or with somebody? I'm not, no. Yeah, that's why you have so much money. <laughs> You know, wait, I just have to say this. Where you're going to have to be careful is when you do have a partner. And 
hopefully you're willing to be as free asking questions and talk about money with your partner as you are with yourself. And just be very, very careful because you're doing great with money. Never co-sign alone as long as you live. All right. This will be our last question. Hi, Susie. I'm Hi. a big fan as well. Um, I just wanted to know your thoughts on 529 uh, college saving accounts. And is that for you, for your kids? I have two small kids. Yeah. Two small kids. And are you fully funding a retirement account? Um, yes, I am. You are. And do you out. an eight-month emergency fund? Yes. You have everything going the way that you should. Okay. Right. I love 529 college savings plan. The place to go is savingforcollege.com. It is a website by Joseph Hurley, who is the nation's expert on 529 plans. Go there, and you will find everything you need to know. Do not fund money ever in a UGMA or a UTMA account, because if you do so, then that's an irrevocable gift to your kids. And when they become 18 or 21, depending on which account you did, it's their money, and they can take it and do anything they want with it. And I've been in the industry long enough to see little Johnny Angel turn into little Johnny Devil <laughs> and at 18 have enough money to fund a very serious drug habit. So you never know what can happen. Also, money in a UGMA or UTMA account counts against the kids for financial aid if you should ever need that. Love 529 plans. Go for it, girlfriend. I one already for my daughter, but I have a son, so I didn't know if I should start one for her Now, well. here's the real question. Do you have a will? Yes. Do you have a living revocable trust? No. No. Do you have a life insurance product yes, policy sure. to protect your kids? Yeah. Who's the beneficiary of the policy? Uh, my husband. Your husband. Something happens to your husband. Who's the next beneficiary? The kids? My, yes. Yes. How old are the kids? Three and one. Do you know that minors can't inherit money? No. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. So if you're, something happens to you and your husband, mm -hmm. and now you have all this money in a life insurance policy going to your kids, it will automatically go into a blocked account at a bank and be locked up in there until they are 18 years of age. So what do you re recommend? You doing? need a living revocable trust so that the main beneficiary of the life insurance policy, number one, is the trust. On retirement accounts, if ever you're married, that your spouse is always the primary beneficiary on a retirement account and the trust is the secondary beneficiary. If you are not married, a trust is always the primary beneficiary. All of you need a living, revocable trust. You think those things are just for older people? They are not. Mama, get a living. You better go tomorrow when that thing is on. And all you have to do is answer the questions, and up will come the documents that you need. Millions of dollars have gone into that program to develop it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Susie, one last question. Um, What's the best piece of career advice you ever got? That I ever got. I got it from my father. And it was, it's better to have 50% of something than 100% of nothing. And it was, it was a good piece of advice for me. So for me, you know, as long as I know that everything's okay. Like, I don't have to really go for it and make every penny and be sad that other people are making money off of me. I'm just happy to make the percentage I do and have a great life. And it's really guided me well. And so for me, that was the best piece of advice. For all of you, what I would probably tell you to do is to make those that you are dependent on a paycheck for dependent upon you. Make those that you are dependent on a paycheck for dependent upon you. Once people know how valuable you are, your price becomes priceless. And with that, you can do anything. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome.